to Canaan's land I'm on my way Where the soul never dies My darkest night will turn to day Where the soul never dies No sad farewell No tear dim song that Kathy sung through Skype to her father was an act of love uh, from Colorado to Eldora, Iowa. And uh, Louis so appreciated that. In fact, he says, you got to come here in my back here in this back room. You got to you got to listen to Kathy and watch this. The first time the computer just went bad. But a couple days later, I went back and we listened to Kathy and he was so pleased and so grateful. On behalf of Louie and Shirley Harrell's family, they thank you for your love, for your presence here today as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And even though they're walking through the valley, they're doing it with joy in their hearts for a life well lived and a long life lived in faith in Jesus. And so we come, yes, with grief and sorrow, but we also come with joy and celebration for Louis Harrell. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for the personality of Louis. We thank you for all the gifts that you displayed through him, the gifts of practical help, the gifts of humor, the gifts of love and tenderness that he displayed at times as your light shone brightly through him. And now, Lord, we pray for your comfort and your joy and your hope to rest upon Shirley and Brent and Kathy and Dave and Peg and their families and for the rest of us gathered here as we say good night to a dear friend. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In an attitude of respect and gratitude, I'd ask us to be still before our God for 89 seconds, symbolizing each year that Louis lived on this earth as he made his pilgrimage back to his God. 
Let's be still and know that God is indeed God. It is finished. Yet in the maddening maze of things and tossed by storm and flood, to one fixed trust my spirit clings. I know that God is good. I long for household voices gone, for vanished smiles I long, but God hath led my dear ones on, and He can do no wrong. I know not what the future hath of marvel or surprise, Assured alone that life and death his mercy underlies. And so beside the silent sea, I wait with muffled oar. No harm from him can come to me on ocean or on shore. I know not where his islands lift their fronded palms in air. I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. John Greenleaf Whittier, Portions of Eternal Goodness. The scripture readings today are from the 103rd Psalm and the 91st Psalm, which were two of Louis' favorite psalms from the Old Testament. So those are a little more extended, but if you'd like to follow along with me and read in your heart and mind these words that have comforted people for 3,000 years, please join me. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. As far as east is from west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who respect Him. And from the 91st Psalm, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, 
nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, in the New Testament, we have these wonderful words from the Apostle Paul. This is the first letter of Paul. This is the, one of the earliest New Testament documents we have. And he says to the believers who are wondering, why hasn't Jesus returned? And the Thessalonians are asking these questions. And Paul says, Do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. And the New Testament is very clear that they use the term falling asleep almost universally when they talk about death. Because the hope is, is that on that great day when God restores all things, the whole cosmos, the dead will rise and those who are still living will join Christ and those who were once dead in glorious power and resurrection. If you'd like to read with me the 23rd Psalm as a statement of your own faith, please join me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you take your hymn books in front of you and turn to hymn number 90, we will stand together and sing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. God of glory, Lord of love, hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Morger of immortal gladness, Fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in Thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living.
living ocean depth of happy rest thou our father christ our brother all who live in love are thine teach us how to love each other lift us to the joy divine mortals join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began love divine is reigning o'er us leading us with mercy's hand ever singing march we onward victors in the midst of strife joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life thank you, you may be seated For the past uh, seven and a half years, I've had the joy and the honor and the privilege to be Louis Harrell's pastor and his friend. He was a great friend. One of the things I will always appreciate about Louis is that he was not a person who put on airs. He wasn't out to impress people. He was only out to impress Jesus. He was a simple man with a simple faith. And that made all the difference. And I will always cherish him because his faith energized and strengthened my faith. And for that, I will forever be grateful to Louis. Louis was born in, on June 21st, 1928, in or near Winterset, to his parents, Cleveland and Mary Tribby Harrell. Louis was the second child, as his older brother, James Harrell, who was born on March 22nd, 1926, greeted him. And then later, Louis would become the big brother to Callie May Harrell, who was born April 27th of 1930. Louis was also greeted by two half-brothers, Wilmer Robert Henson and Edwin J. Henson, the children of Louis's mother, Mary Jane, from a previous marriage. Now the story about how Mary Jane got to Missouri and Iowa is very interesting. Louis's uncle, Claude Harrell, drove out to Oklahoma and picked up this woman named Mary Jane Tribby and her two boys and drove them back to Missouri because Louis's father needed help with his mother, Martha Scott Harrell. And then after Martha passed away, Cleveland, Louis's father, asked Mary Jane to care for the house and stay on. And she replied, I don't think that would look proper. So Cleveland said, then why don't you just marry me? And she said, yes. <laughs> when Louis was only 16 months old, on October 24th of 1929, the darkness of the Great Depression fell over the United States and the world. Louis said that one of the most pleasant feelings he ever had growing up is I was sleeping in the northwest room and the sun peeked over the edge of the world and there was a light breeze blowing in. I was in heaven then. Louis was a cute little boy. The women at the church near Winterset and the women in Winterset would see Louis Harrell coming down the street in his little knickers and his shoes and his shirt. Here's our little Louis. Louis also was ornery. 
When he was a little squirt, he snuck under the quilting rack at the church and found a leg, Martha Mullen's leg, and snapped her garter <laughs> that was holding up her knee-high socks. And now those same women said, Here's our little Louie. <laughs> Louie recalled, My brother James and I walked all over the country. We never thought about asking permission to walk on other people's property. Dad gave us an older riding horse from a neighbor, and we rode it all over the place. This mare was strictly a children's horse. You could pull on her mane. We climbed up on her. We used a string as a bridle. And her colt was named Tony. And we soon outgrew the colt. When he was a little guy, annual journeys from winter set down into Missouri to visit Grandpa and Grandma Tribby were a highlight. He told me how his sister and he would go out to the grapes, out to the grape arbors, before breakfast and stuff themselves with the delicious fruit. One such morning, they went out and had gorged themselves and they came in for breakfast for the first meal of the day and Grandpa Tribby offered a prayer to God and said amen and Callie barfed her grapes up all over the table. <laughs> Louie recalled that his father had two teams of horses, Bill and Bud, consisted of one team, and Eagle and Dolly was the second team. Louie's father had a mustache, and he would rub it on Eagle's nose, and then she would wiggle her nose. Dolly was blind, and Louie remembered, remembered how his dad would call the horses in from the pasture to the barn, and the horses would run full out towards the born, barn, but poor blind Dolly, she would run, and she could hear the wind or sense the fence, and she would put her hooves down and lock up and stop, and then she would turn her ears and she would follow the fence line until she found the opening and went on into the barn. And that just amazed him. It amazed him. He, Louis was very observant. Not only was he observant of animals, he was observant of human beings and loved to watch people. Near the Harrell farm, there was a 40-acre timber and in the midst of those trees, Louis and his brother learned to swim in the neighbor's pond. Louis... One of the themes you're going to hear throughout this eulogy is that Louis was a thief. <laughs> we would find a patch and we would get into it. He's talking about watermelons here. Louis went to Seon, but you know, we were respectful thieves. We didn't stomp on the other melons. We left them for the people who were growing them. We just put a couple under our arms and ran off with them. Louis didn't get to play football. I asked him this question because he was so stout. He explained, no, my mom got to growling around about not getting home early enough to get the chores done. And then Louis said this, I think she was afraid that I would turn into a wild boy. <laughs> Louis took pride in the fact that one of his grandfathers was one of the first settlers in Madison County, Iowa. And Louis's father's farm, Cleveland, his farm was 120 acres. Now, this is the 1920s. That's a pretty good-sized farm. Louis recalled as a child one winter that they had this runt pig whose ears and its tail had frozen off. And there were no bottles at that time to feed the poor creature. So Louis took a pie tin that had a hole in it he took a rag and pulled the rag through the bottom of the pie tin and then poured milk into it. And that little runt would get a hold of that rag and suckle. And he kept that pig alive. Louis nurtured that little runt. And as it grew up, it would follow him like a pet dog. Louis's father, being a little miffed about the runt, said, uh, he's leaving too many calling cards in the yard. On Louis's 11th birthday, baseball great Lou Gehrig was forced to quit baseball because of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. Louis's father was a man of the earth and taught Louis phrases like, I've got to go water the horses. I've got to go drain the radiator. You can figure that out. 
Cleveland's patience towards Lewis and his older brother grew thin at times. Louis and James would sneak into the grape arbor there on the farm south of Winterset. They would get into the strawberry patches and just strip the vines and the stems of the succulent fruit. So angry was Cleveland over Lewis and James harvesting that he planted his own raspberry patch. And Louis said, we did not dare get into that. <laughs> One of Lewis's chores on the farm was cleaning out the chicken house. He said, at that time I thought I was being worked to death and I even thought about running away from home. It didn't hurt Louis any to work hard. He loved gooseberry pie. He could eat a barrel of ripe persimmons. And then he said, but if you, if you bit one that wasn't ripe, you had to wear it off. <laughs> on Louis' 17th birthday, the United States military defeated the Japanese on the island of Okinawa. In his upper teen years, Louis worked hard as a farm boy, and not only on his dad's farm, but for other farmers. He was bucking 2,000 bales a day. This work further strengthened Lewis into this stout man. And one of the pictures that Kathy has, which is really kind of unbelievable, is Louis doing this pose at 70 years old. And he looks like he's about 40. He was a strong man. During those days, Louis had a ferocious appetite. His father kept saying to him, you're going to have to quit eating the field corn because there's not going to be enough for the hogs. <laughs> On June 21st, Louis' birthday in 1950, Joe DiMaggio made his 2,000th hit in the majors. In Winterset, Louis Harrell laid eyes on Shirley May Alley, at the roller skating rink. Louis and his friends had just gotten back from stealing pumpkins. <laughs> they ended their law-breaking cycle at the rink. And Louis's heart fell for Shirley, and he asked her if she wanted a ride home that night. She said yes. Three months later, on July 15, 1951, three months later, Shirley said yes again at the Winterset United Methodist Church in front of Reverend Glenn Parrott. And she wed Louis Harrell, and he wed her. The wedding party consisted, of course, of the pastor and Shirley and Louis, and the best man, Leo, and the bridesmaid, Lola Rosenbaugh. The newlyweds then traveled to Millie Lock, I don't I didn't say that right. Lake in Minnesota and met Shirley's parents for their honeymoon because Shirley's parents didn't know they got married. Nobody knew they got married except those five people. <laughs> the lovebirds then returned and set up housekeeping in a very small farmhouse south of Winterset. And Louise and Shirley's love for each other created two children, David born September 17th of 1952. And on that day, David's advent made Louis a father and thrust him into fatherhood. And in the late winter of 1954, Kathy arrived, rounding out the Harold family. And in 1956, Louis answered an advertisement that was in the Des Moines Tribune from Ed Ferris about needing a farmhand. So Louis came up and met Ed, but the work wasn't going to be enough for uh, Ed to pay Louis enough to support Louis's family. And so Ed was sitting there thinking and said, you know what, I think Lawrence Tatum at Quakerdale may need another man. And Ed contacted Lawrence, who was the farm manager at Quakerdale at that time, and Lawrence hired Louis. Louis and his family lived in that little small house next to the big house there at the campus. And then the next year, they moved out to the West Farm and set up a house there. It was a place that Louis said was surrounded by trees and weeds. <laughs> On that farm, Louis knocked down a small building. And the way he took it down, the whole roof system remained intact. So the roof system was sitting on the ground. And 
David and Kathy had a few little friends over that, that day, and Louie was walking around the farm and said, Hey, kids, you want to see me pick up that roof and carry it? Oh, yeah, yeah, do it. So Louie drops down, crawls under, gets under there, and lifts that whole roof. <laughs> but then he got abdominal cramps. <laughs> and he set it down. He gained his composure. He picked it up again. Again, his abdomen cramped up. He set it down. And then he went all the way down on all fours and crawled out, yelling to David, Bring me a shovel. I can't get up. Bring me a shovel. So Hercules wasn't all that stout. David and Kathy will not forget the little ducks Louis raised in David's little barn. Nor will they forget the flower beds out in front of that house. Nor the strawberry beds and the rows of rhubarb that dad and mom raised. Nor will they forget their father's temper when it came to livestock. He once grabbed an oak yoke and knocked a cow out as cold as a cucumber. Nor will the family forget how... One time, Louis got really angry with this pig, and it was in the dead of winter, and here was Louis marching across through snowdrifts carrying this huge post. I'm going to teach that pig a lesson. <laughs> we can hear his kind of gruff voice saying those things. You know, the other thing about Louis was when he came home from work, a hard day work on the farm, if David and Kathy were out playing, Louie would get down and play with them. If Dave was in the sand pile and the cat was trying to cover Dave, Louie was there to uncover Dave. <laughs> Sorry, that's in the spirit of your dad. I could not resist that. And Louie was this typical farmer, especially growing up through the Great Depression. He was an entrepreneur and he was an inventor. Louis loved wieners. He loved to eat hot dogs. So he made a new way of cooking hot dogs. He took a board, he drove two nails through the board, and then he bent the nails. Then he took the hot dog and put one end into this nail and the other end onto this nail. And then he took a power cord and he hooked the positive to this side and the negative to this side. And they had electrocuted wieners. In the early 1960s, Louis moved his family to New Providence to the stagecoach house over here on East Main. It's that Saltbach house design. And Louis and Shirley would finish raising their children along with Jesse and Bonnie Reese's children, as the families just ran across that yard between them and shared what Christmas presents they had gotten, what was going on, and the Reese's, uh, Denny and Peg, would run over to see what Shirley was cooking, and the Harolds would run back over. And Good times. Great times. Louis took his family camping in a Texas Volkswagen, which was an old converted school bus. He had a big grin on his face, oh, about a, two months ago when he told me this story. He goes, you know, one time we were out there camping and I put the campfire out nature's way. <laughs> and the wind changed. <laughs> and it blew right into our bus. And the women were irate. He goes, the smell was terrible. <laughs> Louis turned 36 in 1964 and was in the prime of his life. And on that same day in 1964, three civil rights workers, Schwerner, Goodman, and Chain, disappeared after being released from a Mississippi jail and their bodies were recovered weeks later. That happened on that same day that Louis turned 36. Milking cows was one of Louis' joys for, I should say, for Henri Louis. 
He would ask his little girl, Kathy, if she wanted to see the star at the end of the teat. And Kathy would get down and he'd go, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oh yes, show me the star, Daddy. And he also would grab Kathy as she got a little older and she would take the, he would take the teat cup that went on the teat and put it on her neck and form a perfect hickey. <laughs> Only Louie would think about that. <laughs> Louie traversed the valley of the shadow of death when his beloved mother, Bali, and her sister were killed in an auto accident after attending Molly's firstborn son's funeral. So Louie had his own shadowy valleys that he had to, to traverse and with his faith, his family, and his friends, he was victorious over those deaths and that sorrow. Louis named his favorite dog uh, Elmer from the Dagwood Bumstead's dog in Blondie. He also made a Elmer moose out of wood and he took two old deer antlers and made the head and stuck the deer antlers out and then used uh, croquet balls as eyes. He called that Elmer too. As I said earlier, Louis was a humble and simple man. He didn't put on airs. He had no one to impress but his Lord Jesus. He once told me concerning his children, I taught them all I know and they still don't know anything. <laughs> Louis was employed by the New Providence School Systems for a time where he served as the custodian for many years. He passed out candy. He was a school bus driver. He passed out candy. And not only that, I know at least one person, Craig Stowe, that he let sit on the heater beside the driver's seat in the bus. <laughs> to run the lever to run the stop sign out when it was time to drop a child or pick up a child. Now that would not happen today. <laughs> but Louis Harrell made it happen. One of the little young little girls that was enamored with Louis because of his strength and his good looks was little Teresa Brewer. And when she got on the bus one day and said, I want to marry you. <laughs> and Louis asked her, what are we going to do with Shirley? And in her innocence, Teresa replied, oh, she can come along too. <laughs> Louis served by managing for a time at Camp Quaker Heights. He and Shirley remodeled the speaker's cabin, which I have stayed in when I was candidating here. Because of their work, my family and I were blessed and more comfortable. They really enjoyed that ministry. Out there at Camp Quaker Heights, Louis had a blind turkey named Isaac. He tied that turkey to the clothesline with a string so the turkey could at least move but not get lost. He had rabbits, he had a pet raccoon, and he had a hound dog. He also went to Guatemala for missionary work. And in 1984, Louis and Shirley decided to make a large change in their lives and they loaded up their belongings and they moved to Forsyth, Missouri. And they did this so they could be near their grandchildren. And Louie and Shirley would spend 20 years plus in the show me state. Louis underwent double knee surgery, replacement surgery at the same time. And he was allowed to do that because of his incredible upper body strength. And he recovered well. Louis was a faithful employee in Missouri of the Royal Oak Briquette Company. And near the end of his career, he was looking forward to this great job in quality control, and Louis suffered a massive stroke, which left his left arm and his left leg not paralyzed, but very restricted. This man's man, is what he would say, I'm a man's man, I don't need sissy stuff. Now, after the stroke and the loss of his ear and as his body was slowly deteriorating, sometimes Lou would be in tears. I'm a man's man. I'm not supposed to be crying. But that's the reality of life. As Louis' hearing deteriorated, 
He would some, sometimes say things in public a bit too loud. Once he said in a restaurant, my big toenails are so hard and yellow, I'll have to use side cutters to get them trimmed. In 2006, Louie and Shirley made the decision to leave Missouri and relocate to Alden, Iowa for a short time and then moved to Eldora to the Pine Lake Apartments in 2007. And Louie and Shirley's main goal was to be a witness for Christ. And they were and are a witness for Christ. One of the great ways they demonstrate the love of Jesus and God is the practice of hospitality. If you've ever been in their apartment, you can't sit there 20 minutes till someone's coming through that door. It was a safe, secure place to come and be loved on and not to be judged. The shortest sentence in the New Testament is Jesus wept and practiced hospitality in Romans 12. Louis suffered yet another loss as his left ear was cancerous and had to be completely removed. You know, Louis was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief like the Lord Jesus. And yet, like Jesus, he kept his eyes on Christ and kept his faith strong. After the loss of his left ear, the sensitive Virginia Tatum brought Louis the ear of a hog as a joke. And Louis took it as a joke. That was Virginia's way of showing her affection. Not too many hours or days later, Lloyd McDonald paid Louis a visit. Lloyd was the pastor here at that time, or at least was associate pastor doing callings. And Louis showed Lloyd the hog's ear that Virginia had given him for this left ear. And all that, all that Lloyd could say was, Looks like you're living high on the hog. <laughs> we, we friends are very gentle with each other. You know, towards the end of Louis's life, uh, he was a man filled with questions. Uh, questions do not offend God. God is big enough for our questions. One of the questions that he asked is, why doesn't God just let me die? I have never met a person who wanted to go be with Jesus more than Louis Harrell. I have never seen a person like this. I said, I don't know, Louis. I don't have all the answers. Louis had questions, and they were unanswerable. And even though the heavens were silent as he struggled and wondered, Louis continued to trust in his Lord. And Louis and Shirley's life verse as a couple is from Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth, trusteth in him. That verse shaped their relationship, shaped their ministry. Because when the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and sight are human experiences. And so what the psalmist is saying is, Experience God. And blessed is the person who trusts in Him. Gratitude was always on Louis's lips. He said concerning the employees at Valley View Nursing Home, they've got some darn good girls here. And he commented on the food. They do have some pretty good chicken soup. <laughs> the missionary Paul wrote, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And just a few days before his transition from this life, I read the 23rd Psalm to him, read John 14 to him. I prayed for Louis. I prayed for death to come. That his prayer would be answered. And he kind of had his eyes halfway open and half shut due to the 
medications he was on to reduce his pain. And as I turned to walk away, his eyes opened up bright and he said, Thank you. Thank you. As we noticed earlier, Louis was born on June 21st of 1928, which is the summer solstice. This is the day that the sun reaches its zenith and its northernmost point in the sky. And on that day, it appears to stop. Summer solstice is the day that has the most light. I think we can say with certitude that through Louis Harrell, God's light shone on us brilliantly and with longevity. Louis let his little light shine. Even a few days before his death, he was sharing his faith with a Valley View employee and she was left with an impression that will not easily be forgotten. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in Him. And then last Sunday, I was working in my office and got a call from Dave about 7.40 saying that Louis had succumbed to cancer at 7.04 a.m. His body had succumbed to cancer, but not his spirit. Louis had given his spirit to Jesus decades earlier and had given his spirit to Jesus day after day after day as he waited for Jesus' second coming. And from the cross, our Lord Jesus said, Unto you I commit my spirit. And Louis lived out those words beautifully. He committed his spirit to Jesus every day. And so, Louis William Harrell, Louis William Harrell, who we fondly call Louis, this tender husband, this great father, grandfather and great-grandfather, brother and friend will be deeply missed. For the next few moments, let's have a time of being still. And if you have a story or a prayer or a thought you'd like to share with the group and especially with the family, would you just simply rise up and Denny will bring you a microphone so that people can hear you. And please, enrich our gathering as we remember our friend Louie. My name is Connie Pemberton. And I have been blessed for so many years to know Louis and even worked with him at times. And he used to come in, I was the head cook at the school in New Providence and with Happy Rash, and he would come in to the kitchen every day to see what we were baking. And he always had to test it out, make sure that it was okay to give to the kids. <laughs> And then one day he came in and he said, well, I'm on a diet. I just can't have any more goodies. And we said, okay, we'll try to help you. And a few days later, we made homemade cinnamon rolls. <laughs> and Louis came in at, in the kitchen and he put his head back and he said, well, I don't suppose one roll would hurt me. <laughs> and we said, Louis, you can have all that you want. We, we were so blessed that he was with us every day and we always had so many good laughs and we bonded together so close. Mm -hmm. I will miss him very much.
I'm Nancy Tatum Stevens, and we lived in the big um, house and when Louie and Shirley and David and Kathy lived in the small one. I have a lot more stories about Shirley, but that will have to wait. But Louie, <laughs> I remember one time my sister Lori and I were alone in the house, and that big house creaked and everything else, and we were sure someone was in the house, because we had no locks on the farmhouse. So we ran down to Louie and said, I called to Louie and said, will you come up and check the house? So he came up, he went through the upstairs, he went through the main floor, he went down in the creepy basement, checked it all out, said we're good. And we thanked him and sent him home. So uh, we appreciated him looking out for us. Anyone else like to share before we continue? If I can speak for Frank. Frank says, boy, I'm going to miss his stories. He was a great storyteller. And uh, we're going to miss that from Louie. Harold and I would like to perform Louie's favorite song. We've sung it about six times so bear with us. <clears throat> Life is like a mountain railway with an engineer that's brave we must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave watch for curves and hills and valleys never falter never fail keep your hands upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail Blessed Savior, Thou will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God's praise forevermore. As you roll across the trestle, spanning Jordan's swelling tide, you'll behold the Union Depot into which your train will glide. There you'll meet the superintendent, God the Father, God the Son, with a hearty, joyous greeting. Weary pilgrim, welcome home. Blessed Savior, that will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God's praise forevermore. Blessed Savior, that will guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in God's praise forevermore where the angels wait to join us in God's praise forevermore 
evermore. You know, one of the things about <coughs> grief, and for some of you this may be your kind of first major loss, and others of you are veterans in grief, but just a few things I'd just like to remind you of is Jesus promises that blessed are they who are mourning shall be comforted. So one of the things that we do not want to do, we do not want to detour the journey through the valley of the shadow. We don't want to deny it. We don't want to uh, bypass this valley. We want to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Pace yourself through this valley. Allow your faith in Christ, the support of your family and your friends, be the energy and the source of your hope and comfort as you walk through the valley. Your grief is going to be as individual as snowflakes and our fingerprints. So there's no reason to compare your grief to each other. And for you, Kathy especially, uh, I want you to be aware of what I call absentee grief. And what I mean by that is that the children who live a distance away, often we will place heaps of guilt on ourselves because we weren't physically close. Do not do that. Your dad loved you, you loved your dad, and that's eternal. He wanted you to live your life, even if that meant in Colorado. So don't guilt trip yourself. And that brings us to the next part, that chronic guilt and shame are useless in our grieving. If you feel like you should have done more for grandpa or dad or great grandpa, then forgive yourself. Learn from it and go on. Our Lord Jesus does not want us to live a life of shooting on ourselves. I should have done this. I should have done that. But what Christ does want to do is to be our teacher and our guide so that in the next relationship, we're more like Him. So be gentle and graceful with your own selves. Anger can also be a, something that can bog us down. and It can be anger towards God, anger towards Louis. Who knows? But that's often very normal. And one of the things I want to say to you, that anything you think about Louis' death, or even now past his death, anything that you have felt, some other human being has thought it or felt it. It's all normal. Even though it doesn't feel normal, it is normal. And moreover, I gave this really glowing eulogy of Louis. And he was a wonderful, great man, but he was not perfect. His faith testifies to us that he himself realized he wasn't perfect because he needed Jesus. He was a sinner. So don't idealize him. But what I do want you to do is take all the good from his life and like a grain bin on the farm, store all that good in your hearts and let the chaff blow away. Just let it go. You know, Christianity claims that there's a new quality of life for those people who will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, who will not get bogged down in useless comparisons, There'll be a fresh quality of life in store for those who can receive God's forgiveness for their own shortcomings in this relationship. A new quality of life ahead for those who will forgive and offer grace to their loved ones, to God, or to whomever they may be angry with. And for those who will not idealize human beings. He was this close to perfection. And the reason he was this close to perfection is because he had his eyes on the perfect one. And that's why I loved that man so much. He was easy to love. Christianity declares through the life embodied by Jesus who 
lived and suffered and died and was raised from the dead, this power of love divine that cannot be stopped. Paul is right. Love never ends. It never fails. For Louis, I'm not sure what Louis is up to right now, to be quite honest. There's different views even in the New Testament. But what we can be rest assured of is what Paul says when he quotes Isaiah. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Jesus says to us, that He is the resurrection and the life. And in the Greek tense of the verb, it means I am right now resurrection and life. This very moment, He offers us resurrection power, the power of universal love in our hearts, the power to forgive, the power to be merciful. That's the resurrection life found in Jesus. And so that's what I ask of you and I ask of all of us is that we have the e internal ears to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd who is always, always calling out to us. Always. Eternal God, we have come before you with thanksgiving for the gift of Louis. Great Shepherd, guide us through this terrain this valley, and lead us to green pastures of life and love and abiding Holy Spirit. Strengthen us in this day and in all of our tomorrows, teaching us, guiding us, expanding our souls through every memory of this wonderful husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, and friend. And precious Lord, may we come to know that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot eventually heal. The Lord is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. Let's take our hymn books. Let's turn to song 406, Wonderful Words of Life. Denny, are you in the building? Is Denny here? Denny, would you go down this... <laughs> fourth pew back and grab hymn books and hand it to these people in the front because we've moved hymn books. So, thank you. Let's rise together and sing wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, listen to the loving call. Wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. 
Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. I'm going to ask a blessing upon the family and upon you and for the meal. And as soon as the family is escorted out, the uh, funeral director will let you out by row. And please join the family in the fellowship hall for a meal because we want to love you at that basic level of life. And uh, so you can enjoy each other's company and reconnect on this day. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you again for your generous spirit that given us the spirit of Louis. We're grateful that you are caring for him in the mystery of heaven. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit which guides us and strengthens us and comforts us in days like today. And we thank you for the meal that the ladies and the men have provided on this day to bless this family and these friends that gather in hopeful remembrance and in joy for a life well lived in the faith. And we ask this in Christ's name. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. If you'll take your bulletin as the family's being escorted out, let's sing together one of Louis' favorite songs, I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. This life have gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away when I die, hallelujah, by and by.